Hello everyone and welcome to the second in our quality online course series, Learning Objectives and Assessments. If you participated in the first one, we gave an overview of what it means to have a quality online course. In this one, we're going to focus specifically on, the, on writing learning objectives for an online course and designing assessments for an online course that match those learning objectives. While this session does not specifically cover Quality Matters, which is the uh, online course quality standards we've adopted here at NIU, it does align with standards two and three, which are about learning objectives and assessments um, correspondingly. And we will discuss some of how that alignment works in more detail as we go through today. But just so that you know, this is primarily about online course quality in general and not quality matters specifically. So there are two of us today to present to you. My name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. And I'm joined with, Trace, joined by, rather, Tracy Miller, the Online Teaching Coordinator, who you will hear from a little bit later. My first question for you is about designing your courses. Let me wait for the slide to come up. Here we go. When you design an online course, how do you know what to teach? I want to take a minute. You could type your comment into the text chat, or um, if you'd like to use your microphone as Rama was earlier, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll let you use your microphone to share. But when you're creating a new online course or teaching an online course, how do you know what to cover, what to teach, how to teach it? I see Bill's typing. I'll let a few others, if you have anything you'd like to share. Bill says, based on the objectives in the syllabus. Someone's been to our workshops before. <laughs> Isabel, I can see, is typing now too. Isabel says, based on the curriculum, for the course and the objectives. Excellent. That's actually exactly what I wanted you to come up with. A quality online course really does start with course objectives. And we'll talk about alignment later uh, as a very specific concept when it comes to course design. Excuse me. <coughs> But the reason why that we say quality online course design starts with course objectives is because those objectives form the, the foundation, if you will, of the course that the rest of the course sort of builds off of. So now my question for you is, what is the source of the course objectives that you use? Did you A, write them yourself, B, uh, are they mandated by your department? C, you get them from the textbooks or publisher, or D, you're, you're not really sure where they come from. You'll notice the polling options above the participant list where you clicked the check mark before to let me know that you could hear me. There's now an A, B, C, D response. So if you would select the one that's the closest, and then if you feel like you need to clarify as Isabel did, you can clarify in the text chat. So again, in the row of buttons above the participant list, you'll see an A in a box. Use that drop down to let me know how, how you get your course level objectives. Rama, did you want to share something? Remember to, ch to press the talk button if you want us to be able to hear you, Rama. You, you, you I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> and you okay. asked me to give a response by yeah. choosing one of those letters uh, where. I don't see where I can. So above the list of names, just below your name, you should see the smiley face and that row of square buttons. 
So there's an A in a checkbox, in a square box, and if you hover over there, you get a drop down menu to choose A, B, C, or D. Um, you see that? Okay. I mean, are you, are you seeing uh, just below my name? And there, so or? at the very top of the screen, we'll start at the top. Do you see the video of me, right? Yes, yes and That's where the talk button is. Below yes. that is the participant window. You should see your name. And right. then you should see a row of square buttons. That's correct. So the fourth button, the one on the right, is the letter right. A. That's where you yes. can select an option. Oh, I can just go click the thing that I think is appropriate? Mm-hmm. OK, let's see. OK. There you go. You chose B. I can see that. Yeah. Excellent. I see. All right, so you can turn your microphone off now and lower your hand. Thank you. And Jim, I want to welcome you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I know it seems like we've been having some issues with connection, so I'm glad that you were able to join. <laughs> it looks like uh, it's about 50-50 right now. Half of you write your own course objectives, and half of you get them from the department. This is fairly common, um, particularly when you have a course that's taught by multiple faculty or instructors that the department may um, mandate what your objectives are, at least at the course level. You might have more freedom when it comes to individual modules or individual weekly objectives, but the course objectives themselves may be mandated. The important thing, though, is that you know that you have objectives and you know what those objectives are. So the next question I have for you is how familiar are you with writing objectives? So again, use that A, B, C, D option. Let me clear it. Hold on. OK. So now you can choose, again, fresh, A, B, C, or D. How familiar are you with writing objectives? A, you're an expert. You could teach others how to do it. B, you're confident in writing objectives yourself. C, you're somewhat familiar. Um, or D, you're a novice. You've heard of objectives, but you haven't really learned anything about them. Again, it looks like we're split. So half of you have a great deal of confidence. Half of you are familiar, but you're not necessarily as confident that you can do that. That's good to know. Uh, we are going to go over a little bit on how to write objectives to start today, and hopefully you'll pick something up. So for the purposes of today, as we talk about how objectives are structured, I have three examples that we'll work with. None of these are necessarily perfect objectives. They could probably all be improved. And if you have suggestions to, suggestions to improve them, by all means, please uh, send those in. But first, here are the three. By the end of this course, you, will, you, the student, will be able to write a thematic analysis paper comparing themes in three works of fiction, develop and deliver an organized and effective persuasive speech that uses visual aids, and draw a well-labeled free body diagram showing all real forces that act on an object. This is a very strange course, by the way, to have these three objectives. Uh, they come from different. Uh, different fields, obviously. But for today, they give us a variety of objectives to look at. So the first thing that I want to highlight about objectives, when the slide comes up, for me at least, is that objectives include three components, a behavior, the conditions, and the criteria. So the behavior is what the students will do. It's an action verb. By the end of this course, you will write a paper. You will deliver a speech. You will draw a diagram. The conditions tell you the circumstances, the constraints that you'll have, or the resources that you'll be given in order to do that performance, that behavior. And then the criteria is how well you need to do that performance. Um, you can be very specific. Mine were pretty vague on the criteria. 
Um, in fact, if we go back for a second, here the criteria for, for example, the third one is showing all real forces. So that's a criteria in terms of how much I expect you to do. In the second one, I'm a little bit more vague. I'd say it's an effective speech, organized and effective. And the first one, I didn't give much criteria at all, uh, other than that it's analysis. But those three components should be in every objective. A few other pieces that you should know uh, about objectives. The first one is that as I said, they, ex they describe what students will do or what students will learn to do as a result of the course. So in each of these now, I've highlighted the component that shows <clears throat> what the students will learn. So they're learning thematic analysis, persuasive speaking, or the forces that act on an object. These are topics, they're also um, activities, they, they show what skill the student will have. The second piece that you should know about objectives is that objectives are written always from the student's perspective. So this doesn't say by the end of this course you will have read the book, you will have uh, taken quizzes, or even that um, by the end of this course you will have, I will have, as in the faculty, I will have taught you about this. These are all from the student's perspective. You, the student, will write a paper, develop a speech, draw a diagram. So it's as though the, the, you're speaking directly to the student. That's one of the most important characteristics about objectives. Um, I think it's far too common for objectives to be written that are actually course goals. And it's almost a course outline, not necessarily a, um, a learning objective. The third thing is that learning objectives are observable. That means it's a behavior you can actually see. Uh, so by the end of the course, you will write, you will develop and deliver, you will draw. These are, again, all tasks that can be seen and observed. This takes you away from words like understand. I can't see that you understand. If you understand, for example, how to do a thematic analysis, I can see that you've written a thematic analysis paper. But I don't know that you really do understand. These are the observable behaviors associated with that understand task. So it's important when you write objectives to stick with observable action verbs, things that you can see and things that students can do. That relates to the next aspect of learning objectives, which is that they are measurable. That means that you have a task that can be, well, measured. Um, for example, if the learning objective is to write a thematic analysis, that compares themes in three works of fiction. I can measure that. I can tell that you've compared themes. I can even rate how well you have measured those themes with a, probably with a rubric, to be honest. Um, for number two, again, it's an organized and effective persuasive speech that uses visual aids. I can observe that and with an objective or with a rubric, with a checklist, I can actually measure that as well. The same, the third one, draw a well-labeled free body diagram. Again, perfectly measurable. They're not necessarily easily measured, but they are measurable. And that difficulty of measuring, that strategy of measuring, is where your expertise as um, faculty really comes into play. And the final component that I want to talk about for learning objectives is that learning objectives should be at an appropriate level 
for the course that you're teaching. This one is a little bit harder to get to because it definitely requires your subject matter knowledge as faculty, as instructor, to, to really show that you know where students should be. So I don't know if you've taken any courses with objectives like this, but try to take a guess. Um, we'll just discuss some. What level, what course would these be appropriate for, do you think? Are these a 100 level intro course? Are these maybe a, a deeper level 400 level course for a major? You can use the text chat. Um, just give me a summary of where do you think these course objectives belong? Anyone? The first two gym at a 200 level. That's probably a fairly good guess, um, for, certainly for the, the first one. The second one, I was kind of shooting for a, a 100 level intro to um, public speaking course. Um, but I think it would certainly be appropriate at a 200 level as well. Um, that's why I said some of these, it, you wouldn't expect an objective like the, the fourth one may not be appropriate for an intro level physics course, a 100 level. It might be more appropriate for uh, a higher, a more advanced science course or dynamics and engineering, for example. But Isabel is absolutely correct. They, often these can be used at multiple levels just depending on the content that you're using with them. For example, that free body diagram, I might have one where there are two forces acting on the object and you have to be able to describe them. Whereas at the 400 level, maybe there are eight or 12 forces. So I've used the same objective, but maybe scaled the content. That's exactly why um, looking at learning objectives is difficult when you aren't familiar with the subject matter. So do keep that in mind as you're looking at your objectives, that uh, to think about whether or not they are written in a way that looks like they're appropriate for that level of course. And as we'll discuss in a moment, that the materials and the activities that um, you use as well are consistent with the level that the course is at. So I have a bold statement. Um, you may agree or disagree, but this is my, my bold statement. Quality online course design includes module objectives. So all of our courses should have course level objectives. They go on the syllabus. You probably have between three and seven, probably five to seven. Um, there might be more or less course level objectives. And that might be all that you have. For an online course, however, where students have to find the threads themselves, they have to understand uh, how the course relates. Module level objectives are actually really important and really useful and really helpful for students to understand what they're going, what they're going through. By module, by the way, I should clarify, by module, I mean any group of content. So this might be a week. You might have units that are longer, that are two to three to four weeks long. Um, that's fine. It doesn't have to be the same discrete unit. And you might not call them modules. You might call them topics or weeks or units. Um, module I'm using here as a generic term. These module objectives then are more granular than the course objectives. They, they provide more detail and should map to those course objectives. So for example, if we're looking at writing a thematic analysis paper, um, comparing themes in three works of fiction, 
one module might look at particular types of themes, or it might look at particular works of fiction. And so I would have objectives related to thematic analysis for that module that were specific to what we were discussing there. Module objectives can also be sequenced in increasing mastery. What I mean by that is at the beginning of the course, your module objective around um, thematic analysis might be that you can identify common themes the first week, and maybe the or first module. The second module, maybe I ask that um, given a new work of fiction, you can identify themes. So the first time we did it together, the second time you'll do it on your own, and then the third module is where I'll have you start comparing themes. Um, so they're actually sequenced in increasing difficulty and demonstrating increasing mastery of the content. And then, of course, as I said, these module objectives support the course objectives so that you can see where each of these module objectives points toward a course objective that students will have mastered by the end of the semester. And that really brings us to the concept of alignment. Alignment, to me, is about bringing everything together, uh, matching everything up. So each module objective should support one of those course objectives. Uh, you shouldn't have a module objective that hangs off on its own, and you shouldn't have a course objective that isn't supported by any module objectives. And sharing this information with your students helps them create a map of how the course comes together. Let me give you an example of what that might look like. Uh, this comes from a course that I taught. It was a course on program evaluation. And so we had four course objectives, which you'll see across the top here. These are the four course level objectives. Explain the different roles of evaluation. Explain the evaluation methodologies apply evaluation methodologies to authentic situations, and plan a program evaluation. These are too big to do all at once. So for example, that plan a program evaluation we worked on for the entire semester. And you can see that because I have several module level objectives. Um, I didn't include here which module these belong to, and I probably should have. But you can see that, so the first week, the first module, one of the module objectives was to explore the logic of program evaluation. And that mapped over here to planning a program evaluation. I really only talked specifically about the logic once. We had one reading assignment, and we had one activity for it. Um, but once they had mastered that, that came up throughout the semester and was really foundational in being able to be successful. Others, like um, selecting an appropriate model of evaluation, actually supported several course objectives. So this one related to explaining evaluation methodologies, applying evaluation methodologies, and planning the overall program evaluation. If you haven't thought about something like this before, I highly recommend it. It really forces you to think about what you're doing in each module or in each week, and how that keeps pushing students forward, how it brings them to those course objectives that they should master by the end of the course. Are there any questions on, on this alignment component? I'll pause for a moment. No? OK. I really think that this is, alignment is one of those fundamental concepts when it comes to course planning and course design. Once you start thinking about how all of the components work together, not just here, 
uh, the course objectives and the module objectives, but really all of the aspects, the components of the course, including uh, assessments, learning activities, the materials, the content that you use, uh, and the technology that you use. If you think about how all of those relate back to these initial uh, learning objectives, then you'll have a course that actually comes together as a, a comprehensive, holistic piece and will help students feel like they're drawn through the entire experience. So as I said, this is a, uh, a workshop on course design, particularly online course design, not quality matters. But since we have adopted the quality matters standards for online courses at NIU, here's how this relates to QM. Quality courses have measurable course objectives, which are consistent with module level objectives, that are written from the learner's perspective clearly relate to the course activities and are suited to the level of the course. Each of those lines are one of the five um, review standards that are part of General Standard 2 in the Quality Matters framework. If you aren't familiar uh, with Quality Matters, I would recommend going back and watching the first workshop in the series, Ensuring Quality in Online Courses. In that, um, in that webinar workshop, online workshop, we covered what the QM process is and what the general standards are. So we'll include a link to that in the follow-up email from this, but I highly recommend if you, if you aren't familiar yet with this that you go back and look at that. But this will show the different pieces that we've talked about so far map directly into the specific review standards in general standard two. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Tracy, who will start talking about how you design assessments for your online course. All right, well, um, thank you. I feel like I've talked to a few of you, actually, this afternoon as we were trying to, to get into this session. So thank you for your persistence in getting in there. I'm, I'm very happy to see everyone. So. We're going to switch gears a little bit and start talking about assessments now. Uh, but in some ways, um, you're going to see some, some common themes as things go through here. So let's start talking about assessments. So what I want to do is if you could put in the text chat area, what is your favorite assessment and why do you use it? All right, I see some folks putting things in there. Small group discussions, I'll have to participate discussions and research papers. I bet you your students love those research papers, Isabel. I have them right there, project prospectus. I like papers for academic classes because they require thinking, synthesizing, and, and explaining. OK, so that's getting at the why you use it, right? You want them to think and synthesize. OK, well, let's move on to the next slide because I have a good answer for you. The correct answer of why you use it is because it directly measures the course objectives. I told you we were going to connect this for you. Um, so if your um, course objective is for students to demonstrate critical thinking, um, that is definitely something that you want to make sure that they can do through their assessments. And then just like we talked about the course objectives, we're also going to talk about how they align um, with not only the course objectives and those module objectives that Stephanie talked about, but they also align with the learning materials, uh, the course activities, and um, the, course acti the um, course technology that we're using throughout. So I'm just going to briefly touch on those in this point because come to the next webinar to find out more about those. 
But not only do the course objectives and the module objectives need to align, but now they need to align with the assessments and kind of everything needs to um, fit all together. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how we can really ensure that they all fit together. Oh, Stephanie writes, and if your reason is important and it isn't objective, it should be. I agree with that completely. So we have the course objectives, we have the module objectives, we have assessments now. Um, so I'm going to use one of our maps to kind of talk through how that might actually, that alignment um, might start looking when you're mapping your assessments to your um, objectives. So we have another one of our maps up here. And in this table, um, the assessments are in column one. And the ob objectives are across the top, the way we had them before. And now, instead of adding um, the module objectives the way that Stephanie did earlier, what we've done is we've added the different assessments. And so in order to be really clear about how these assessments um, are measuring the different learning objectives, we've really identified what each assessment is trying to get at. So in the case of the program perspective, um, we're going to use this to measure or assess the students' learning in um, explaining different roles in the evaluation. Um, we're also going to be using it to help us assess um, whether or not they can explain different evaluation methodologies, um, and so on and so forth. And one of the things that you might notice here is that if you have an assessment that you, are, you don't really find is being measured, is measuring any of the learning objectives, um, or if you have a learning objective that doesn't have an assessment tied to it, um, then there's something missing there. So, you know, something needs a little bit more work. But I also want you to notice that every single assessment doesn't have to measure every single um, objective, okay? So we've got some, some blank spaces in here, and that's fine um, because, you know, you're going to overwhelm them. There's going to be too much if you know, everything is tied to everything else. But it's nice that you have some multiple assessments for each. And we're going to talk a little bit more about um, some of this idea of having multiple assessments. And the way we titled this was the power of multiple measurements. And so one of the things is that it's always a good idea to have multiple ways for students to demonstrate their understanding. Um, and in this case, there's you know six different assessments, and um, each assessment is at least, you know, getting at two different um, learning objectives, and there's a couple assessments for each of learning objectives. So it just gives them, you know, many, many different ways that they can demonstrate that they're starting to catch on to things. Um, there's also um, multiple ways to, for students to, I'm going to actually go back to this one. There's multiple ways for students to receive feedback when there's multiple assessments on the same learning objective. And so in this way, students might, as they're kind of beginning to grasp those concepts, they're getting feedback from other students, and they're also getting feedback from you. And so that can help them. It's kind of scaffolding it. It's, it's helping them develop, and those learning objectives are hopefully becoming more and more clear because they're getting that feedback from you. Um, and Stephanie talked about this with the module level objectives. Things need to be sequenced in a way um, in order to build that mastery and, and help them go from a, you know, a very basic concept and build on that and, and move into higher levels of learning. And then all of the assessments should um, 
requires some active involvement on the student's part. And that's what we mean by this act, active or experiential learning. Um, I'm going to flip back to that other table again because I just love it so much. If you look at the action verbs that are in some of these um, learning objectives, explain and apply and plan, these are all going to be, require some very active involvement in the students in order to be able to demonstrate their mastery in this concept. And then when you look at some of the adjectives that we've used um, in the assessments, kind of go along with them, um, the students are going to um, create a design document that shows action. Um, they're going to be showing measurements and measuring things. All this is, is tying it back to that idea of they're, they're really involved in their own learning at this point. So um, any comments or questions on what we mean by the, the power of multiple measurements? Okay, we'll just throw it in the chat area if you do have any questions that pop up. Uh, then, oh, okay. Rama, did you want to talk? Yeah, on the last point, experiential, um, you know, bullet point, can you give a concrete example on the previous slide? Yeah. Right, <laughs> okay. So, um, let me see. So, experiential is, um, sort of gets at um, using a, a real world example of something. So let's, let's actually take a look at how we might um, do an assessment on evaluation measures. Maybe in this case, um, the students, part of their plan is conducting an interview or a survey. So they're evaluating something through um, like I said, a, an interview or a survey and they're going to go out on the street and they're going to ask people questions. Um, and so in that way, they're, they're literally ha having to do something. They're having to go out and, um, oh, and step, I know Stephanie's going to have more input because she actually taught the course, but they're actually doing something that, you know, they would really do in the field. But chime in, Stephanie. Uh, what I wanted to point out is, um, essentially what, what we're trying to get at with this is to break the stereotype of online courses as you, you watch a presentation or read an article and take a quiz, right? That, that's kind of the stereotype of an online course. It's content quiz, content quiz, content quiz over and over and over again. And the, that, that leads to very superficial learning on the student's part because they're memorizing things for a multiple choice quiz. Whereas having students engage in some sort of activity, whether that is talking to one another, whether that is writing and, and doing a deeper analysis themselves, or uh, conducting an experiment, as Tracy mentioned, conducting interviews or I had students actually, um, it wasn't active physically, but they were creating a program plan. So they, they put the pieces together, they discussed them in their own teams, they got feedback from each other. There was no way for them to be passive in that process. So it's, like I said, the, it's primarily about making sure that students are actively thinking, reflecting, and processing what they're learning. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Thank yes, you I, good. Thank you, Rama. Um, OK, so now we're going to talk about something else that's really important when we're talking about an online course environment. And that's that um, students have real clear understanding about how they're going to be graded. And that's always tied to the assessments, right? And so one of the things that's recommended in general standard number three, and that's what we're talking about here um, if we tie it back to quality matters, is that, you know, an online course 
really clearly needs to state the grading policy or how students will be graded. And um, an example could be that there's just a list of activities and um, that are going to be used to determine the final grade. Um, and a, a grading policy also might have um, something like your policy on late submissions. Um, and you know, th that's your policy. You can decide, but just making that very clear that you know, late work will not be accepted or uh, late work will be, um, points will be deducted. Making that all very clear for the students um, is something that's going to bring down their anxiety level and they're going to understand um, how those assessments fit into their overall um, grading of the course. Uh, it's also recommended that you have um, some very clear criteria on not only what the points are going to be, but how you are going to grade each assignment and each assessment. And what are your expectations? Um, what do you consider um, a good body of, of work if, for instance, you're going to use exemplars? You know, it's kind of making that criteria really clear. And you know, uh, in faculty development, we love our rubrics. And so, you know, letting the students know how they're going to be graded and exactly what your expectations are um, are another really great, um, important part of an online course environment. Um, and then, you know, to use point values is one of the other things that um, might just that might be clear enough to let the students know that, you know, a 10-point quiz has a very different um, grade impact than a 300-point um, final paper, a research paper. Getting back to Isabel's favorite, Isabel, how much, how many points do you put onto a research paper? I see you're typing. Okay, I'll, I'll keep looking, but I want to talk a little bit about um, feedback. And we talked about feedback earlier. Okay, for a class of 1,000, paper 200, discussion 500. Okay, so that gives the students a really good idea of um, how they're going to be graded and where you're, you're putting the importance in there um, based off of the points. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so feedback. Um, how do you give your students feedback currently? And that, this can be in a face-to-face -face course or an online course. You can type that into the text chat. Okay, Bill does it orally through the grade book, right? Even their grades are feedback, right? Annotated their papers, time writing feedback to them individually. Yes, these are all good, important ways to provide feedback. And when you're in a face-to-face -face environment, which I think was one of the, the first ones that um, popped up there, you know, feedback, is, it, it just happens. You're there in front of them, and in some ways, when you're talking about designing an online course, the way you provide feedback needs to be part of actually your planning process. And so, I created um, a, another table here, and I took the assessments that we had from the first table, and uh, I intentionally thought, okay, what kind of feedback do I imagine or am I going to try to make sure it's easy for the students into my course when I'm designing it? And so I created this table and I thought, you know, okay, 
I've got a discussion board, and I know how it relates to the learning objectives. I know I want this frequent feedback for my students. Um, and so in this case, the primary feedback is going to be student to student. I'm going to monitor the discussion board, but I'm also um, I'm going to let the students to really um, provide the feed, most of the feedback in this case and help them sort of learn from each other. And so you can kind of see the way this goes down. I'll go to the logic model because that sort of has a lot of check marks next to it. So in the logic model, you know, um, I'm going to I'm going to annotate the logic model. I'm going to allow them to maybe uh, do a first draft, and I'm going to provide them with feedback on how they can improve the logic model. Um, you know, and, and I'm thinking about that ahead of time because I'm going to pace my workload, and I'm going to make sure that I can provide them with some real um, feedback with their logic model. Maybe I'm even going to provide them that grade. So I'm going to grade their first draft in order to let them know where they're at and where they might make improvements. But you know what? It also might be something like a self-check, where the students are maybe reflecting on their own learning, or they're, they're kind of soaking it all in. OK, this logic model isn't quite working yet. You know, what do I need to do? How do I know that I can make improvements? Um, because it just didn't feel right the first time, and, and now I want to make some improvements. Um, this one over on the end here, adaptive technology. Um, Stephanie and I kind of threw this one in here because I don't think it's something that we can um, necessarily dive deep into, but it's something to introduce you to. So if you're using um, perhaps publisher content or something that um, can do this sort of adaptive technology. The idea is that when the students are engaged in this, they might have opportunities for the computer or the, um, the program to give them sort of some feedback. And either it's going to tell them that um, you know they did right or wrong or something, or it may even adapt to if they're struggling with a concept, um, it's going to bring them down to that kind of lower level scaffold um, in order to reinforce some concepts that are kind of built off of this new concept and elevate them to the next level. Or if they, they're easily getting through the content, the assessments are showing that they're, they're confident in it, they're going to bring them to a higher level. So that's just like a adaptive technology in 30 seconds um, talk. But you know, it's something to kind of consider another way that students may be um, getting feedback. Um, it may be through um, a robot almost. Uh, but just going through it and thinking about, OK, I've got my assessments. I know that they are you know, measuring my learning objectives. But I've also heard that this feedback idea is pretty important. And so how am I going to now design um, and plan for that feedback um, as I'm going through the course? And it may be something that you're you're doing and it's all up here, but now you just kind of want to put it into one of these maps in order to, to help the process a little bit more. So I'm going to try to wrap it up in the last couple minutes here. Um, but again, we're going to bring it back to Quality Matters. So what Quality Matters standard number three is saying is that assessments, um, there's multiple and varied assessments that measure course and learning objectives. Um, they have a clear grading policy that includes descriptive criteria for evaluation, and that there are opportunities to, for students to track their progress. And so um, we have added in what they call these specific review standards in here. So basically, if you are putting together an online course and you can kind of check these items off, you're already off to a really great start. So in summary, what we talked about today is um, that the, the importance of having strong course and module objectives, um, that measurable objectives are student-centered and they're observable, um, that the assessments should align with the objectives, um, and that 
grading policies need to be clear and direct and students know what you expect from them and that students um, should always have frequent feedback on their progress. Wrapping things up, Stephanie and I are so glad that you struggled to get on, but you did and you persisted and that you stayed. Um, this is some information on how to get in contact with us. Are there any final questions? Okay, I see Jim has a question. Hi. Okay, Ronald, would you like to talk while they're typing yeah, in? I guess my question is uh, subject specific uh, uh, materials that are especially, you know, um, aligned with uh, what you spoke about you know, uh, which are ideal for online teaching. Say, I'm in statistics myself. Um, I don't okay. know. Uh, I, I think having listened to uh, the presentation today, I'm kind of curious to know what's out there. Because uh, I'm, 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 I've never taught online courses before. So it's a bit tricky uh, to bring the same um, Kind of effectiveness to to the online uh, to the online teaching. So the the the, the uh, would you agree that the standard textbooks uh, will, will, do they help or uh, to what extent do they help or uh, do you need some uh, other materials to to you know give a good experience to students in online teaching? Right. Uh, well, so I think the specific course materials that you were talking about was a textbook and whether or not mm -hmm. that was sort of enough. Um, it, I would say it kind of depends on the textbook. Um, but like Stephanie mentioned earlier, this idea of sort of reading something and taking a quiz um, and then reading something else and taking a quiz um, is not enough. Um, that you need some some more active involvement in it, and so you know it kind of depends on the textbook. A lot of the textbook publishers now um, are building in um, you know more of the e-textbooks where you know there's videos and there are self checks that you can take or processes or steps that are kind of woven in online, and and so you know I would say yeah, traditional textbook you know that sort of method of uh, read something and taking a quiz um, is probably not going to be enough. And I think if you kind of go through some of these um, checks that we've talked about today, that you're going to find uh, that mm -hmm. there are some holes and, you know, then we can talk about, okay, let's find some course materials that are going to fill those holes. Well, actually, uh, can I ask you one more question, maybe, and then I say no? Um, Hello? Yes, you can you can ask a question. I know that we might have some folks that are kind of dropping off here. Um, oh, okay, maybe I will wait for others to. Why don't you um, address others' question then and ask a question later? Okay, it looks like Stephanie has taken Katie's question and put it into the text chat. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for that. I'll just summarize the uh, uh, audio if you'd like, Katie. Essentially, and for anyone else in the room. Uh, we're happy to consult with you about your course design, either before you begin the process or um, at the end if you just want to check of the course before you uh, let it go live. You can simply email any of us and we are happy to, uh, to do that for you. Thank you. Okay, Rama, did you have another question? Okay, well, um, if you don't, that's fine. We're going to talk about course materials, actually, in one of our upcoming um, webinars that are part of this series. And so if you do have more questions um, specific about course materials and um, even uh, student interaction was something that we talked about, uh, look for some of our upcoming um, 
online workshops because we're definitely going to be covering each one of those components in more detail. And then finally, for everyone hanging out, um, we have access, uh, given you access to a couple documents. Um, we're calling them checklists for meeting quality standards, uh, both two and three. So if you have the opportunity to download those or save those when you get into the session, you have them available. We'll attach them to the survey and the follow-up email also, just in case. Um, but there's a big draft across the front of them because there are still work in process. We want to be able to meet everyone's um, needs as they sort of come up. So if something doesn't make sense to you um, or there's something that uh, we need to add, let us know because it is, like I said, big letters draft. We're um, trying to come up with more and more tools to help everyone out. Uh, so that being said, thank you so much. Stephanie, do you have any final words? No, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you.